Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. So this colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from under traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we'll have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. Welcome to another episode of TGC. This is our fifth colloquium of this season. And uh, happy April Fools, everybody, by the way. Though it may be April Fools, the content of these talks is going to be far from a prank. Again, we've got some very interesting talks lined up today. In fact, our first speaker comes all the way from the Czech Technical University in Prague, where she is a PhD student. I can't wait to hear this talk because uh, this paper addresses a seemingly simple um, sounding problem, but it unveils a lot of hidden complexity that I never would have thought existed. And the question really is, how come colors don't really mix in painting software? If you're a digital artist, maybe you know what we're talking about here. And the answer really isn't that simple, but the solution is absolutely elegant. Please welcome Sharka Sokhorova. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Adman, for the beautiful introduction. So my name is Sharka and I will be presenting and talking about color in digital painting and about pigment mixing. So let's start with what I mean with pigment mixing. I mean the behavior of pigmented paints that we're all used to from real life. And this goes back to kindergarten. So what you're looking at is not really surprising, I know but that's why it's important to highlight those pigment effects because otherwise we might take them a little bit for granted. So in real life, blue and yellow make green and notice how dark this blue pigment is. Uh, it's called phthalo blue and it produces this beautiful grassy green when mixed with yellow. Now let's have a look what happens to phthalo blue when we mix it with white. It changes hue to, to turquoise and it drastically increases saturation. And this happens to other pigments too. Magenta goes from dark red to pink and phthalo green goes from green to cyan. And the same happens with pigments when we just spread them on canvas. They shift hue and gain saturation. And look at those beautiful gradients. And these are just three examples, but all paints do this to some extent. And we can see these gradients in practically every physical painting because this is the way paints behave. So um, we might expect color in painting software to behave the same way, right? Something like this. Well, they don't. Um, none of the widely used professionally painting software treats colors as pigments. So what happens to color in painting software instead? So generally, and there are some exceptions, but generally they treat color as, as light and mix it additively in RGB. And additive mixing is basically a weighted linear average. And if you make an average of blue and yellow in RGB, you really do get gray. It's correct for emitted light for a, from a computer screen, for example, but that's not how paints behave, as you can see from this slide. So, um, using additive mixing in a painting software seems wrong. And now you might think, well, what about subtractive mixing? Isn't that the answer to paint-like color behavior? Well, it's a little bit closer, but it's a still no. Uh, subtractive mixing models the absorption of light passing through colored filters. And this is kind of curious, but the algebraic operation for light absorption is multiplication, not subtraction. We're not subtracting anything here. The light spectra are multiplied during absorption. So here's just a quick example. We all know that magenta and cyan make blue in subtractive mixing, right? So this is the spectrum of magenta and this is the spectrum of cyan. And the resulting blue spectrum is their interception. It's a per wavelength multiplication. So subtractive mixing is a completely misleading notification. Anyway, um, physically, this is still incorrect because 
light absorption is just a part of the pigment mixing process. Paints don't just absorb light, they also scatter it. And that's vitally important because look how wrong this looks. Uh, so the bottom line is that subtractive mixing is not the answer to pigments behavior. And it should also be called multiplicative mixing. So let's move on from this. What happens to light when it passes through a paint blob? And you already know the answer. It gets repeatedly absorbed and scattered. And this is a pretty familiar phenomena for people in graphics because this is subsurface scattering. And if you want to model realistic pigments behavior, you need to simulate subsurface scattering, which in rendering is done with path tracing. So now you may think, well, this kind of explains why no pigment, why no paint painting software implements it, because you don't have time for path tracing in digital painting, except we don't need path tracing. Um, almost a century ago, there was this duo, Pavel Kubelka and Franz Mung, who came up with a closed form solution to all this. The, the result of subsurface scattering is a reflectance spectrum. It's the color of the material in question. And Kubelka and Munk gave us a diffuse reflectance formula predicting just that. All you need is two spectra measured directly from the pigment, its absorption and scatter, which is the K and S coefficients in the equation. So when you mix two or more pigments together, you just make a linear combination of their absorption and spectra coefficients uh, absorption and scatter coefficients, and you pass it through this equation and get the color of the mixture. So that's how easy it is. And look how beautifully Kubelka and Munk predicts the behavior if, of paints. It's almost unbelievably accurate. And the bottleneck here is the correct measurement of the two spectra from the pigment. But luckily there are some data, data sets available today. So now is a good time to ask, why isn't this perfectly accurate pigment mixing model used in digital painting industry? And we think that the answer might be that it's too impractical to use. Uh, there are some papers proposing ways to use Kubelka and Munk in painting software, but they all require tracking of some pretty complex features per pixel. So for example, Hassan Mayer proposed to track the absorption and scatter spectra sampled. Um, Baxter proposed tracking the pre-selected pigments concentrations. So until now, using Kubelka and Munk in painting software required to increase substantially the number of per pixel channels. But every painting software operates on three RGB channels plus alpha. And you might think that today, increasing the number of per pixel channels should not be that big of a problem, but still nobody seems to be willing to do it. So it probably is. And on top of that, using real pigments gives you a reduced color gamut. It doesn't cover all the RGB colors, which means that the artists would lose their RGB picker and they also wouldn't be able to load and work with photographs. Photographs. So um, these are the limitations that kept the, de the developers from implementing pigment mixing into painting software. And we knew that if we wanted to change that, we would have to come up with a model that uses Kubelka Munk for color mixing, but it operates purely on RGB and covers the whole RGB gamut. And that's what we did. We created this black box that takes two RGB colors, arbitrary RGB colors, and represents each of them as a mixture of four selected primary pigments. And then it uses Kubelka Munk to mix them together and it outputs the final RGB. We call this mix box and it's really easy to plug into any existing painting software because it's literally just a drop-in for the current mixing function. They have the same, the same um, attributes. So now about some issues that we faced. This is the gamut from the primary pigments that we chose. So these are actually the RGB colors that can be reproduced with those pigments. But obviously there are some RGB colors that cannot be mixed with real pigments. And another issue, there are pigment mixtures 
that can be represented in RGB because they're outside of the gamut. Um, so that was a problem. But I don't want to get into details how we solve this because it's not really important now. I wanted to focus on this huge gap and why there were papers about pigment mixing in computer graphics lying on the table for three decades and none of the painting software had it implemented. And our guess was that it was too impractical. So we came up with this RGB in RGB out pigment mixing model that hides all the physics by Kubo Kamung inside, and it acts as a black box, which makes it accessible to, to developers. So now we'll see what happens. Uh, but it's already in Rebel, which is a leading software in simulating traditional media. So the natural color mixing was a perfect fit. And I'll show you some, uh, some results now. So this is Rebel, and I prepared a reference image with a color swatch. So I'll be using these colors that you can see. And I also have two layers here, one with the pigment feature off and the other one with the pigment feature on. And I'll start with pigments off. So now I'm just painting with uh, the classical additive mixing. And you can see that the simulation of watercolors and oil is beautiful, but the colors coming from it are really muddy and dull, pretty desaturated. And also the brushstrokes that you're seeing now are pretty boring. They're really dull, just lifeless. So now we'll do the same with the pigments on. And I'm using the same brushes and the same starting colors. And you can already see that this looks much more realistic, right? The watercolors actually look like real watercolors. And the oils too, and with all the secondary colors popping up, it just, it just feels more right. Now, look at these brushstrokes that I'm painting right now. I'm using the same color as on the left side, but the turquoise and pink and slightly purple color are peeking through the thin layers of the brushstroke, and it makes a huge difference on how we perceive the color of the brushstroke. So uh, you wouldn't be able to actually achieve this with additive mixing. So with pigment mixing, you get juicier brushstrokes for free. Uh, and the whole painting process is just more intuitive and creative. And that's not, that doesn't apply just to traditionally trained artists. I think that digital artists would also appreciate having this, you know, lively color behavior as an option because they wouldn't have to worry about their painting getting desaturated like this thing on the left um, with using semi-transparent brushes and after repetitive blending. So I think this is kind of a win situation for all the artists. So, and that's it. Uh, this is the end. I just wanted to tell you that if you want to try it out, we have a live demo uh, on our website and it runs in the browser. So you don't have to download anything. You can just go ahead and paint and try it out and feel the difference on your own. So if you want, go and try it and let us know what you think. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sharka. Uh, that was, I love the visualizations. And was that really a live demo that you did while you were talking? No, I actually pre-recorded <laughs> it. I was just like, the commentary was live. Mm -hmm. Well, it was still very impressive. Um, so thank you very much for that talk. We've got another talk dealing with, um, you know, image-based uh, problems in the world. Uh, we deal with images all the time. And in fact, I'm still not even convinced that the universe isn't just a bunch of tiny images put correctly in front of my eyes. Talk about an April Fool's prank. Uh, but understanding the relationships between images and the content that they contain and how to manipulate that content has been of interest to scientists and artists since the invention of the very first digital camera. And so I'm very excited to hear from our very, our very next speaker who is an expert in this area. Um, he's a professor of computer science at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. He got his PhD at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and he's an expert in image processing and works at the intersection of graphics and computer vision. Please welcome Professor Manuel Oliveira. Professor? Hold on. Yes, I'm here. 
I need to share my screen then. Sure. Um, A second. So I guess the let's hold on just a second. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the delay. I guess now we are all set to go, right? Yeah, we're all good. Okay, so uh, then uh, thank you for the, the introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be able to address this audience. And uh, I, I wanna say that uh, uh, in this geometry colloquium, I will be talking about geometry, but not geometry in the say conventional sense, it's often used in graphics uh, while we deal with uh, uh, 3D Euclidean spaces and objects represented by polygonal meshes. I will instead uh, be dealing with uh, structured patterns that uh, we find in images and videos. And uh, I will be considering the challenge that they pose, uh, especially when we deal with uh, image and video downscaling. So the works that I'll be presenting here um, are done in collaboration with uh, Eduardo Gastal and Rafael Lucena, all from the Federal University of Rio Grande School in Brazil. So uh, downscaling is one of the most prevalent image processing operations. It's applied, for instance, when we preview images and videos in digital cameras, smartphones, and concorders, when we shop online, use Instagram, or when we browse uh, our family photo albums. However, uh, some spatial frequencies that we find in those images uh, sometimes may not be representable uh, in the target resolution. And if we simply apply subsampling, uh, sub we might uh, obtain some uh, nasty aliasing artifacts. In order to minimize those uh, problems, those scaling techniques often apply a low pass filter before resampling. And uh, while this can effectively get rid of aliasing, they actually introduce another problem because they tend to discard important information, important features in those images. In this particular example, uh, the stripes from the shirt. So recently, uh, several techniques have been proposed to improve image downscaling. And while they are quite successful, uh, they do not uh, and they are not ideal uh, for preserving high frequency uh, structured contents, which are in some cases, as in the example of the shirt that I just showed you, a key component of the image. So uh, for instance, uh, you can consider the, the example of this uh, photograph shown on the left, but the shirt again. And uh, on the right, I show you several images that have been downscaled using several techniques. And as we zoom in um, on those uh, pictures, you can observe that subsampling uh, introduces strong aliasing artifacts. But uh, aliasing can also be found in the image at the bottom row. In particular, you can uh, even observe that the stripes have been uh, rotated by 90 degrees in those uh, uh, downscaled versions. But uh, even the image on the top right that uh, use uh, pre-filtering, they still are not free from artifacts because um, they have uh, got rid of the high frequency content that is uh, a key mark uh, for this particular shirt. So uh, in this talk, I will present a technique called spectral remapping that helps to avoid these undesirable effects. I will then discuss how the, uh, the spectral remapping ideas can be extended to perform in real time and uh, also to be applied to videos. So let's for a moment uh, return to our previous example. And uh, let's recall that aliasing results from trying to sample high frequency content at a not high enough uh, sampling rate. Um, 
And uh, by, you know, just making this simple observation, um, we already have some uh, strong suggestion of a conceptual alternative to this problem, which is not ignore or discard those frequencies, but remap them. And this is uh, precisely what uh, I will be describing to you. So our technique exploits this notion and works by remapping high frequencies to low ones, which are representable at the target uh, spatial resolution. So the spectrally remapped image that is shown here on the left, if we then provide it as input to um, say a downscaling technique, as I'm showing here, then it will produce a result that uh, looks much better than the previous ones. Note, for instance, that uh, the direction of the stripes have been preserved. And uh, since this technique is based on this fundamental observation, it is orthogonal and complements downscaling techniques. Um, and here I show you a direct comparison between the results uh, without and with spectral remapping. And uh, you can see that in all cases, the stripes have been preserved. So at this point, let's recap what is uh, the key observation of uh, everything that I told you so far. So um, it is the fact that uh, uh, we can represent high frequency structured content in downscaled image uh, by spectrally remapping this content to lower frequencies that are representable at the target resolution. So uh, having said that, let me give you uh, some example to provide additional intuition. So if you consider this uh, image shown here on the left, this uh, circular chirp, um, it uh, becomes clear that uh, it contains several high frequency uh, um, waves. And this is also clear as we observe its power spectrum. So if we try to just subsample this uh, chirp image, we'll get an alias result that does not look at all as the original image. So in this case, the original uh, image on the left was downscaled to only 64 by 64 pixels, and you see the alias result. Well, uh, but uh, whenever we talk about downscaling, we have already uh, predefined by the scaling factor, the downscaling factor, uh, the range of original frequencies that are representable at the target resolution. So if uh, the, uh, the downscaling factor is R, then the range of representable uh, resolution or frequencies range from minus pi over r to pi over r. And this defines a square in this spectrum as I'm showing here um, with this white square. Um, and uh, one thing is that even though only the frequencies inside the, this uh, rectangle are representable, if we decide to perform reconstruction using only those frequencies, then we will get a result that is equivalent to prefuting, and therefore the result will look blurry. So in order to avoid discarding those relevant high frequency components, we instead um, propose to uh, map those frequencies inside this region. Um, and, uh, uh, for convenience, we'll be replacing the square with a circle and we refer to it as the spectral circle. Well, uh, once we have frequencies inside the circle, we can now reconstruct an image with the same resolution as the original one, and we call this a spectrally mapped image. You can note that frequencies do not keep increasing indefinitely, um, they have a maximum frequency and they are repeated from some point on. But as we directly apply, apply subsampling to it, we get a result that is a much better representation compared to the previous ones uh, for the original uh, circular chirp. So now that I've given you this uh, first uh, intuition, let me show you a more, uh, uh, slightly more complex example. So here is an image that contains complex uh, uh, representation, waves in many directions, 
and uh, with uh, different frequencies. And so uh, for this particular image, if we are interested in creating uh, a spectral remapped image for a particular resolution of uh, 180 by 144 in this particular example, you should note that uh, this mapping is specific for a given target resolution since this resolution defines the range of representable frequencies. So we can uh, take a, a closer look at uh, those two images. And uh, this inspection shows that we have spectrally remapped patterns that are uh, oriented uh, in multiple directions. And we also can observe that uh, the low frequency content has been kept and changed. So uh, once we have this spectral remapped image, we can actually perform the downscaling. And in this particular example, consider, for instance, applying it, uh, applying it uh, with uh, uh, a Lanxus uh, filtering, uh, as well as uh, just applying the, for comparison, just apply Lanxus filtering to, to perform downscaling. Um, so here we can have uh, a direct comparison and you can see that the stripes are clearly visible in the image uh, at the center, right, with the green um, um, highlight. So, um, so far I've provided you with some intuition and I've given a couple of examples illustrating the use of the technique. Now, let me provide an outline to guide you through the remaining of the talk. So I will start by uh, presenting the details of the, re, uh, the spectral remapping uh, pipeline. Then I will dive a little bit in the main points, in the main aspects of the technique that include frequency remapping, no harmonic decomposition and phase alignment. Then I'll show you some results. Then I will describe how those elements that I've presented can be used to produce real-time performance as well as to be applied to videos. And then I will summarize the talk. Okay, so uh, here's an overview of the pipeline. Uh, it's starting with uh, an input image. Uh, we'll then split it in several uh, patches. Those are overlapping patches, and each patch is, is uh, handled completely independent from each other. In each of those patches, we'll be interested in identifying uh, their spectrum content, and we'll be uh, primarily interested in, in waves with uh, very high energy content. So remember our uh, spectral circle. So by position the spectral circle, we can decide which one of those components are outside of uh, the spectral circle and which ones are inside or do not have enough energy to worthwhile performing this remapping. And those uh, other ones are considered residual. So uh, once we have a decomposition like this, then we can apply spectral remapping only to the waves that are outside the spectral circle. And once we've done that, we can recombine both results, um, reassemble the patch and uh, recompose or uh, rebuild the image. So this is uh, pretty much the, the pipeline. Uh, and now let's uh, go into the details of those individual uh, steps. Um, taking a look at uh, the, the first portion where we starting from a uh, patch, we end up uh, computing their spectrum. So we use a bunch of uh, overlapping patches, and this is important because uh, we need to have uh, continuity after we recombine those images. And uh, given a patch, you could consider applying um, a DFT or obtain its spectrum by directly applying a DFT. But uh, if you do so, you realize that the spectrum turned out to be quite noisy. A much uh, cleaner and better uh, spectrum could be obtained if before we multiply this patch by a Gaussian window. Uh, as we do this, we uh, 
obtain much, much cleaner spectrum for which will be much easier to identify the frequencies we are interested in. So, but as we multiply this by this uh, Gaussian window, we are in fact uh, creating the conditions to obtain um, a, an image decomposition in, into a set of uh, harmonic Gabor atoms. They are represented here in 1D, but in fact, they would be uh, two-dimensional ones. And so we end up having, as you observe uh, in this spectrum here, uh, a harmonic decomposition where those uh, uh, Gabor atoms would be integer multiples of uh, fundamental uh, frequency. Uh, uh, but in, 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 in practice, we are very much interested in non-harmonic decomposition because when we look at a natural image, na uh, non-harmonic waves uh, happen all the time. And actually, uh, they are the most uh, prevalent ones. So we'll be interested in finding a representation that is not limited to those uh, fixed positions, but uh, being able to capture uh, representations at arbitrary positions in this spectrum. All right, so uh, once uh, we uh, look for this, we are interested in identifying the actual uh, positions in the spectrum where those waves uh, do leave. Uh, get their frequencies, also will be interested in getting their amplitudes and, and phase and everything. And, but once we uh, identify those, we can then uh, perform the remapping of the ones that are outside of uh, the spectral circle. And once we've done this, we uh, are, you know, we've done a significant amount of job, but we are not completely done because we still need to consider the fact that as we move those, uh, the frequency of those uh, waves, we also uh, cause problems to their phases that might not be matching anymore. So in order to give you some intuition of why this happens, for instance, consider a situation where we had uh, uh, you know, some pixels or some patches that would be overlapping and containing a given frequency. As we split this into overlapping patches, we can now perform uh, frequency remapping. Uh, we do this, we do this separate for each one of them, but as we try to put those guys back together in order to reconstruct the image, we realize that uh, the phases don't match anymore. So it's not enough to just remap frequencies, but we need to somehow readjust the phases of every single one of uh, those waves. and. Uh, uh, once we then put all together, we get a correct reconstruction. Well, we've uh, uh, seen that uh, after this point, we, we are pretty much uh, ready to reconstruct the, the image from the individual patches. So we're going to do this from the Gable expansion that I mentioned uh, previously, right? So at, at uh, this point, you need to remember that we have performed some operations uh, that have to be uh, undone. So we need to undo the GFT applied to each one of those patches. And then we have also to compensate for the multiplication by the Gaussian window. So we have to uh, multiply by its dual window. And uh, this is pretty much uh, the entire algorithm. So let me give you uh, a little bit more of uh, details and intuition in 1D, and I will do so for a combination of a frequency remapping and non harmonic decomposition. So just to make sure that uh, you clearly understand all the details. All right, so for frequency remapping, then consider this uh, cosine function here represented by 20 samples. It, uh, uh, completes five cycles during this period. Therefore, it's a five hertz uh, wave. And if we compute its GFT, then you're going to get a very clean amplitude spectrum, all zeros uh, except at uh, five. And uh, this has also uh, a nice analytical representation. Um, if we would like to obtain from this representation 
say a lower uh, uh, frequency wave, let's say a two wave, uh, two hertz uh, wave, all I have to do is replace you know, the frequency, right? Um, and if we have uh, multiple uh, harmonic uh, frequencies here, uh, multiple harmonic waves, they are some will be uh will correspond to the sum of the amplitude spectrum and this is very clean and nice we can easily um detect those uh, individual waves and remember if in an image we have multiple such waves we would like to identify all of them um, and so by uh looking at the spectrum uh, based on your knowledge of the gft uh you know that uh you can perform you know, this identification using uh, GFT, uh, no problem. You can identify all those harmonic waves. But as I told you, uh, we are interested in non-harmonic waves uh, because they are prevalent in, in, in natural signals such as images and videos. So let's consider here a, a different situation. So instead of the 5 hertz uh, signal that we do have, imagine now, that uh, um, I have, say, a five and, and a half uh, hertz. So the signal or the frequency changes slightly, the amplitude spectrum changes uh, significantly. So as we look at it now, we, we see that it's, it's a linear combination of uh, harmonic waves. Um, so many coefficients, even though we're representing a single no harmonic, no harmonic uh, frequency, Right. So um, uh, if we look at the underlying continuous signal, we'll see this, uh, this uh, sink. And uh, one uh, point to be noted is that uh, uh, the peak at the sink corresponds exactly at the frequency uh, uh, of the wave. So it's 5.5 uh, hertz. And if we remember, uh, uh, this situation also and apply it to uh, a harmonic wave, we'll see that it matches properly and nicely. And therefore the full spectrum would be just like this. But uh, as you can see, we can directly identify all those uh, frequencies, say in this example, two and five, five and a half, uh, directly just using the GFT. We need to find some uh, different ways of doing this. And uh, uh, if you remember my previous comment uh, uh, that uh, multiplication by Gaussian window would uh, turn spectra uh, much cleaner and much nicer, then we're going to use this here uh, again. So it's just the uh, 1G representation of what I showed you before. So if we multiply the signal by a Gaussian window, we will note that uh, this um, highly oscillating uh, sync spectrum will turn into a nicer Gaussian spectrum. Uh, but the peak of the Gaussian is still positioned at the proper, at the, the frequency we are interested in. And this will be also true for the case of harmonic waves. Therefore, uh, the sum of the spectra will produce something as I'm showing you here. But as you see, it's much easier to detect uh, Gaussian peaks in this discrete spectrum. And this is exactly what we're going to be doing to be able to detect non-harmonic uh, frequencies. OK, so uh, uh, if you remember, um, the, the peak would be uh, at the center, or in other words, the, the frequency we are interested in is associated to the Gaussian peak. And uh, uh, we can also recall that uh, if we compute the log of a Gaussian function, we get a problem. Therefore, uh, we can consider an algorithm to finding those peaks by uh, fitting, uh, uh, say, uh, second order functions to the logarithmic of the spectrum of that uh, uh, image, which I before multiplied it by a Gaussian window. So with this uh, in mind, we are ready to define and now going to obtain 
uh, no harmonic composition of uh, our spectrum. So starting from uh, the DFT of the Gaussian window uh, patch, uh, all we need to do is first find the DFT coefficient with the largest magnitude. Let's say this is the one here pointed by this arrow. Then we use its neighborhood to fit a quadratic surface. Um, as we do so, we then can find the position of its peak and identify as the frequency that I'm interested in. In this case, in 2D would be a pair of a frequency in, in both directions. Um, we also take the maximum value as the wave's amplitude. And uh, for the wave's phase, we have a closed form solution. I will refer you to the paper. Um, but uh, once we have uh, collected all those elements, we have a complete wave with uh, frequency, amplitude, and phase. And we can then sort of subtract this amount of energy from our spectrum. And as we do so, we get a cleaner one. We have then to save this, uh, this detected wave for later uh, to be applied for the mapping, right? Um, and then we can continue with this process by finding the next peak uh, and, and uh, proceeding with the uh, same steps. Okay, so uh, let me give you um, a 2D example uh, to illustrate this. Uh, for instance, if we consider this particular patch that I'm showing here on the left, then uh, for this algorithm, we identify three non-harmonic waves. And uh, for those, two pairs would be uh, outside the, spect uh, the spectral circle, and therefore we'll treat them separately. Uh, for this one, you know, no harmonic, no representable waves, would be interested um, in sort of uh, moving them inside the circle. Uh, for the no harmonic but representable plus the residual, we don't have to do anything. We just keep it and change it. But again, as you already know, we'll be recombining both um, in order to obtain a new spectrum that will then, uh, at this point, I will just uh, zoom in and uh, remind you that all the information is now inside the spectral circle. And uh, also, I want to remind you that the spectral circle is inside this Nyquist range. Therefore, all the information there contained can be properly represented at the target resolution. Um, remember that there's also additional information like you know those uh, low amplitude uh, data that uh, we just keep like this and, and let it for the downscaling technique, for the resampling technique to handle. Okay, so let me say a few words about uh, phase alignment. So as I told you in the beginning, we start with a bunch of uh, overlapping patches uh, here represented, and then we perform uh, this uh, uh, reduction of uh, frequencies. Once uh, remapped, they uh, are shown here, they look beautiful, but unfortunately, as we try to put all them together, well, their faces do not match, and we end up observing those uh, artifacts that are due to phase misalignments. So before we can rebuild the image, we need to perform phase shift as I already uh, anticipated to you. And uh, uh, once we do so, then we are able to uh, recombine the image in a much better uh, way. So in order to perform phase alignment, we'll be building what we call a patch graph. So a graph where each patch is connected to its four neighbors. So considering this, uh, the, this four neighborhood, um, they will be connected to the, the, the neighbors on top, at the bottom, uh, left and right. And um, once we build this graph, we'll then we'll solve uh, a least square optimization where we look to get those neighbor elements here with uh, coincident uh, values for those uh, uh, waves. And so um, once we've done this, we're ready to just rebuild the image. Um, I will then start to show you a few results. 
let me start by showing this uh, uh, hand-drawn portrait uh, that has been downscaled using various techniques, as you can see. And uh, I will then show you the result obtained after uh, the pre-processing using spectral mapping. And you can see that uh, it already is capable of preserving some uh, important aspects of the original hatching, like the, the uh, lines in the background and the clothes, as well as the curvy lines in the hair uh, and the beard. So let me zoom in so that you can uh, see this uh, in more detail. So again, here's the original, I mean, the original uh, downscaling and after uh, the spectral remapping. So let me move back and forth so that you can compare. Again, notes that uh, um, we're capable of preserving the orientation of those lines. Show you one more example here. Um, a fish that has been downscaled to only 63 by 50 pixels. And this is a situation for which even uh, the the techniques that use pre-filtering that are shown here on the top right, they actually suffer from, uh, from alias. As you can see, um, let me try to point here with the mouse, you can see here um, those uh, artifacts. And uh, as we apply uh, spectral remapping and then downscale the image, you see that the results look much better. The image, the lines are better preserved. Here's another example, uh, is a very challenging example as we um, perform a very aggressive uh, downscaling from 1200 by 1600 pixels to only 60 by 80 pixels. And uh, the, the input image also contains several high frequency periodic patterns. So the downscaled versions uh, using previous approach um, uh, shows severe aliasing, even in the case of the ones that use prefuting, as you can uh, note there. I will then show you the results after applying spectral mapping. And let me uh, again move back and forth so that you can consider better the aliasing that appears in this case of um, uh, the prefuting situation. Okay, so now. Uh, let me describe how these ideas can be extended to achieve a real-time performance as well as to be applied to videos. And, and this is based on some recent work presented at uh, Eurographics. Mm -hmm. So what I'll be describing to you is what uh, I would uh, uh, call some novel perspective on, on uh, frequency manipulation. And this is based on theory of instantaneous frequency and also on phase unraveling. So this will be done by pre-computing space frequency decomposition, pretty much what we did before, as well as uh, phase unwrapping. And uh, uh, this uh, will allow us to make uh, frequency adjustment in, in real time, as you can see in the image on the bottom right. So, uh, in this work, we also introduced some uh, phase and wrapping technique that uh, is capable of handling unordered phases and also handle sign ambiguity. I'm not going to go into those details. I will spare you from, from them, uh, but uh, this is an important uh, part of the work. I will, however, provide you with uh, all the intuition and some examples so that you understand uh, the principles. So for this uh, intuition, consider here this uh, simple signal. Uh, it's one day signal. Um, and uh, you can imagine that uh, it say represents uh, uh, the pixel intensity values as we go uh, across one line of an image from left to right. Well, uh, and you can see that we have represent the phase function uh, theta as theta of uh, omega of t uh, times t plus some uh, theta uh, naught. And with this, we allow, for instance, that uh, the, the, the frequency of the phase vary instantly. Um, uh, we also uh, could be varying the amplitude, but we're not doing it, it at, this, uh, at this time. 
for this example. But what is instructive about this is the fact that we can, in fact, by differentiating this uh, phase function theta with respect to t, we obtain omega of t, which uh, we call the instantaneous frequency. And this is interesting because we can then imagine recovering theta by integrating omega. And once we have uh, obtained information about theta and uh, as well as uh, uh, the amplitude value on a per pixel basis, then we should be able to reconstruct the image uh, individually uh, on each pixel uh, in parallel. And this is what supports our work in real time, this ability of uh, working independently for every single pixel. And also, um, if we take this phase function and we scale it by some value, say, bigger than one, then we'll be uh, smoothly uh, increasing the frequency of uh, my signal. We could, of course, uh, multiply it by a number between zero and one and reduce its frequency. And uh, of course, um, if we consider uh, multiple such signals that are crossing over a pixel, we can then just sum all of them. And by linearity, all what I told you before uh, is still valid. So this brings us to an important observation. That is, if we detect the amplitude and phases of waves, defining the intensities of image pixels, we can then uh, adjust the image frequency content as we, uh, we want uh, by increasing or decreasing its frequency content. Okay, so given this uh, initial, this 1D intuition, let me then move on to a two-dimensional example. In this case, we replace this one-dimensional domain T by a two-dimensional domain uh, X. And so, as we say, for instance, we start playing with uh, the value alpha by multiplying the phase function, we get uh, a very smooth transition, very smooth animation. And as I told you, this can be done independently on a per pixel basis. Well, the important thing here, though, is that this phase function has to be known. It must be known, and it has to be smooth. So let's uh, take a, a closer look at this context here. So we need this smooth phase function. But as I already told you, if uh, we say compute the gradient of this function, we'll be obtaining the instantaneous frequencies. And this will give me not only um, some amplitude, but also direction associated uh, to the wave. So it's telling me how the wave is moving. But more importantly also, uh, remember that if I scale uh, this phase function, I will be indeed also scaling the gradient. Therefore, I'm scaling all the frequencies. And, and this is what allows us to very easily by just using a simple scalar value to multiply the phase function, we obtain very smooth, um, say, increase or decrease of the frequency content. All right, so as I told you, um, we need some, uh, we need theta, uh, this phase function to be smooth in regions where the, the, the image high frequency details vary continuously. If this is not satisfied, then we might observe discontinuities as we try to change um, the frequency content. And uh, um, in the previous part of the talk, when I was uh, describing you about uh, uh, spectral remapping, I showed you how we could uh, obtain some uh, uh, phase. Uh, I noted here by, by phi hat, and uh, this was enough to be able to reconstruct an image. But unfortunately, this uh, phi hat uh, function, it's not properly smooth. For instance, uh, it's wrapped uh, to the zero pi interval, and it's also uh, sort of uh, uh, ambiguous uh, with respect to sign. So this is not good enough. 
uh, we need to do something else. We need to be able to recover some uh, uh, continuous uh, phase function. Um, I will again spare you of the details. I refer you to the paper for this, but I will tell you that uh, in this work, um, we come up with a, a way of obtaining some smooth phase function from the non-smooth um, phi hat one. And uh, because of this, phi can be used to perform a frequency adjustment. So um, in the paper, uh, we describe how this can be done. Uh, it's based on uh, uh, weighted with squares, and it can also handle multiple waves that, that will be crossing uh, through um, you know, same and neighbor pixels, and this is somehow complicated we need to take care of. All right, so let me then uh, show you uh, the steps of uh, this process here. So given an input image, I uh, would be uh, then interested in obtaining a bunch of uh, amplitude values, um, and you can see this already, this based on a per pixel uh, that we do this, but more than that, I will uh, soon go back to this point. Uh, also, we obtain a set of uh, instantaneous phi hat uh, gradients uh, for every single one of those pixels. And as I already pointed there, we have to do this uh, on a per channel and per relevant wave as well. So for each pixel, for each channel, we have to consider what are the relevant waves that path through that particular pixel and contribute to it, meaning what are those waves which have high amplitude information, high energy. Well, uh, we also recover the residual. Um, all this has been done uh, using the techniques uh, uh, developed for spectral remapping. And with them, we can, as I already have uh, indicated to you, recover an image, the original image, no problem, and could even uh, change, uh, reduce, uh, remap those frequencies, but not be able to animate them. So for this, we need to uh, be able to obtain some uh, uh, un uh, unwrapped phases, some uh, smooth and varying uh, phases. And this is done using a technique, uh, this weighted least squares technique that I mentioned, it's described in the paper. And uh, so once we have those, we are ready to start scaling and then uh, re-evaluating those uh, phase functions, then combining with uh, the amplitude information to reconstruct a bunch of uh, frequency adjusted components. Those, remember, are based on uh, channels and also on relevant waves. We have to recover one for each. Well, but once we have those things, we can just recombine with the residual image and then obtain our uh, frequently map. And uh, remember, this is then once, and once we have this, uh, this information uh, extracted, then we will be able to um, change those frequencies dynamically in real time. So uh, let me show you some uh, results. So starting with uh, this example of Barbara that you've uh, seen already, but now uh, enlarged, but we can see that uh, the values, uh, the frequency values can be changed uh, quickly in real time. Um, we can also uh, use stencil masks to indicate which portions should be affected by which uh, scaling factors. For instance, in this case, the scarf has been scaled by an effect of 0 0.2, while the paints by 0 0.6. But we can uh, reverse this and obtain a different result. Um, here is another example where we have this uh, a lizard image and, uh, uh, for instance, see the original uh, frequency content, which uh, in this image has been, the frequency have been decreased by multiplying by alpha equals to 0 0.25. But we can not only decrease, we can also increase frequencies as I show you in this example by multiplying by 1.25. And uh, I wanna show you um, another example here. 
Um, so considered as a hand drawing image, very high frequency content, we can, by using multiple scaling factors, obtain different uh, results, different effects, and note all of them are entirely consistent with the remaining of the image. Just to give you an idea of time, I've been talking about real time in comparisons with uh, spectral mapping. So just to give you this uh, um, impression, um, so for this frequency adjustment, uh, for this particular example that I'm showing you, it can be done in, in 10 milliseconds, whereas, uh, and by the way, this is done on a GPU, uh, whereas uh, for spectral mapping, it would take 1.5 seconds. Um, both techniques require some pre-processing. The pre-processing for the for this frequency adjustment is uh, about 8.8 .8 seconds for this example, and it covers both uh, uh, space frequency analysis and phase unwrapping. And it's done once per image, and after this, you can rescale uh, the frequency arbitrarily. For the case of spectral remapping, you do this once uh, per image per target resolution, and it takes 7.8 seconds um, for the space frequency analysis. Okay, so uh, here is an illustration. You can see this as we zoom out, uh, the frequencies have been uh, automatically in the chart uh, so that uh, changed and adjusted to, so that you could see now it has been uh, changed manually. So both of the frequency in this case now, uh, the phases have been manually adjusted. Um, and uh, uh, now I'll, I'll move to a video example. Look at, uh, in this case, um, see we are changing the, the frequency of uh, those patterns, uh, increasing and then decreasing the frequencies uh, um, in real time. Um, we can also zoom uh, out meaning applying some uh, reduction uh, to those images, and uh, we can compute the, the new uh, scaling factors automatically based on the, the resolution of the image, the, the support of the, the target image. Um, I'll play this video once again so that you can uh, have a chance to look at it once more. Okay, so at this point, let me uh, summarize the talk. So I present to you uh, an image downscaling technique that is capable of uh, representing high frequency structured patterns. Um, our method works by remapping high frequencies to the representable range of the target resolution. And to achieve this, we introduce new techniques for estimating frequency, amplitude, and phase of spatially localized waves. Our method handles arbitrary uh, frequency content, not just uh, stripes, um, and it can be used with uh, any resampling technique. I also showed you how to use those, uh, this notion, all those concepts that I presented you to achieve a real-time technique for spatial frequency adjustment, um, and this technique allows us to treat independently every single pixel of the image, therefore being amenable to a simple and efficient GPU implementation. Um, it also can be used to automatically adjust the frequency during, uh, during resizing, as I showed you. And uh, I also mentioned, even though I did not provide uh, an, you know, many details, um, we also introduce a novel phase and wrapping technique that is capable of handling uh, sign ambiguity and also handle several unordered phase components. And I mentioned this here, even, uh, even though I did not talk much about this, uh, because this is a very important part of this work. So at this point, I would like to thank um, our sponsors and people who provided image and code that we use in this project. 
I would then uh, thank you for your attention. Um, and I would like to say that uh, our source code and data is available on GitHub and our, on our project uh, web page. I would like to encourage you to check them out play with the code and come up with uh, new and creative applications and extensions for those techniques. And if you come up with something interesting, please let us know. We'd love to, we would love to hear from you. So thank you again. Thank you, Professor, for that uh, very informative talk. Um, so we're going to go ahead with the Q&A session now. Now, and uh, we're going to start with questions for uh, Sharka that we received, uh, giving Professor Manuel to um, take a step back and relax for a little bit. Um, so, uh, Sharka, we, we have a question. This, this is more of a basic question, but uh, we noticed that we, when we're thinking of paint in real life, sometimes different things affect its color, like the thing that we're painting on or how wet or dry the paint is. Um, is this something that's at all considered in any of the um, painting, uh, digital painting works that you've uh, seen in your related work section or, or in your method, for example? Uh, yeah, um, thank you for the question. It, um, it actually is considered and it is all in the absorption and spectra coefficients of the measured pigments. So the data set that we used was from acrylic paints and they are glossy when you take them out of the tube and the gloss changes the perception of the color. It makes it uh, lighter and more saturated. So um, we had to apply something called Saunderson's uh, coefficient compensation for that gloss, um, but Actually, the, the behavior of these acrylic paints is baked in the, the mix box because we use these abs uh, absorption and scatter coefficients. So when you use this mix box for watercolors, for example, that have different, um, that have a different behavior, it still acts like acrylics. So that's not entirely correct, but it's still better than additive mixing. And uh, obviously there are, um, there is a difference between mixing and between layering paint, paints. And Kubelka and Munk has mm -hmm. another equation for actually layering paints with certain thickness that comes into consideration. And uh, we just took the first step and we just implemented the pigment mixing using the absorption and scatter spectra from the acrylic paints. And this is all baked in. Um, so that's future work. Using other using other physics to model different paints behavior and get a little closer to the to the realistic behavior of watercolors or oils or pastels, etc. Absolutely, yeah, that makes sense. It's also really interesting to think about how the thickness of paint would affect its uh, yeah. color when you layer it. Um, I have a few, we I have a few more questions actually about this. Um, you you've mentioned that the RGB color spec, the RGB file format or channel format, it isn't really, um, doesn't really help with this material model for paint that you're coming up with, right? Like you would, you would appreciate if we could have more channels. Um, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, is there, is, what about different channel formats? Is there, if there was such a, ch a channel format for images that had like as many channels as we needed, like a hundred channels. Would that would, would that still would that be perfect for you, or would there still be something missing there? So actually, um, so, 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 um, what Mixbox does is kind of an approximation because we because we only take into consideration a limited uh, number of pigments. But if you if you could use I don't know, 72 channels per pixel, you could actually track the absorption and scatter coefficients of as many pigments as, as you have measured, you know, because you would keep in each pixel the, um, the mixed, the, the linear combination of, uh, of the absorption and scatter spectra. So that would make the pigment behavior perfect, 
but it doesn't solve the uh, gamut covering issue. You know, you would still have a limited palette of colors to use. So the color mixing would be perfect. It would be identical to real life, uh, but you wouldn't be able to use the RGB color picker. So you would still have to make something to extend the gamut, something, for example, like what we did, but I didn't talk about it, so I don't want to reference it, but some hacks to actually cover the whole gamut. I see, I see. And actually this leads well to this other question we got from the chat is that um, maybe this is actually what you do, but can, can you use some sort of dimensionality reduction that takes that space of the full gamut that you want to cover with your multiple channels, but only uh, compresses it for a three channel solution? Yeah, it actually kind of is what we do because cool. we introduced this Latin space where we represent color, RGB color as concentrations for pigments. And we have like four concentrations. And with this four number, we can reproduce um, the absorption and spectra, uh, <laughs> scatter spectra um, of the mixture. So we actually perform a dimensional reduction uh, in this form, uh, but I can imagine other um, other approaches and that might work too. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool, very cool work. Um, we also have some questions for Professor Manuel Oliveira. Um, let's see. So your spectral remapping looks amazing in terms of preserving image structure when you downsample. And we're wondering if there's some sort of relationship between that and other sorts of theoretical image perceptual metrics. So like, it, is there a perceptual metric that measures how similar two different two images are that your spectral remapping um, uh, respects, I suppose, or your spectral remapping has some sort of optimal uh, optimality like argument with respect to that metric? So thanks for the question. Um, uh, not specifically any uh, any any metric. And 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 by the way, there might be some uh, uh, perceptual metrics available out there, but we did not uh, investigate this and did not try any of them. Of course, there are uh, metrics like uh, uh, you know structural similarity and others that could be tried. Um, we did not do any uh, in this respect. No. Mm, I see. And so, so on a similar track, we like, we love to see these types of like frequency remapping techniques, but we're always thinking from a geom geometry perspective because we're a geometry colloquium. Can we, we would love to get this to work on like 3D shapes. So maybe 3D textures on like a, a surface mesh. Uh, in your opinion, what is the biggest bottleneck limiting your approach from working on curved surfaces? Or does it already work from on curved surfaces out of the box? Well, um, right now it does not work on those, uh, you know, 3D representations, but uh, it does work on videos, right? As you showed um, by it's a, a more natural extension from image to videos. Um, uh, see, uh, dealing with uh, spectral properties of uh, meshes and uh, 3D uh, structures, I think, it's a, a completely different uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, subject and, uh, and context. So I, I wouldn't say how this could be directly applied um, to, to 3D meshes, but uh, there might be, you know, ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> one more thing is that we're wondering how this generalizes even across images. Uh, if you had an image with a lot of high frequency modes, like if you can picture a forest, it might have the, the, the trunks of the trees make one frequency mode, but then also the leaves have another high frequency mode. Can your method handle uh, downsampling and upsampling both of those um, frequency modes at the same time, or will one dominate and you will only be downsampling, upsampling one? Okay, so let, let's see if I understood the question. So you're mm -hmm. saying, well, uh, you would uh, have uh, some content with, uh, you know, many different, uh, uh, say, frequencies. And then you would like to maybe uh, sort of uh, enhance a few and uh, sort of uh, then um, sort of uh, 
scale up ones and scale down other ones, right? So That's right. Uh, in principle, this could be done, but this is not the way we are doing it right now, right? But uh, since you perform this, uh, this frequency uh, decomposition, then you could select, well, for this particular range of frequency, you could apply something and for another one, you apply a different uh, constant. We, we didn't do this based on frequencies. We did this based on some uh, uh, spatial, um, say, support, as I described in the case of uh, the stencil masks. But, but uh, in principle, it could be done. But uh, the question is, uh, in order to select something for uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, remapping somehow, we need to have also uh, waves with uh, amplitudes that uh, convey enough energy, enough contribution to the image. So we may end up having a bunch of high frequencies, but uh, with low amplitude and, and you know, doing this, unless you decided to also scale the amplitude and then you start changing things more. Mm -hmm. But in principle, it could be done, yes. I see, cool, very cool. And one more, maybe more practical question. Do you find the frequency spectrum on the three channel RGB image or is it like a, a grayscale image? What, what defines the, the frequency spectrum here exactly? Well, um, for this particular uh, case, you, you you end up computing it for the individual uh, channels, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why you do this is because um, if you if you handle, say, uh, each one of the channels independently, then the optimization that is looking for this phase alignment and everything among one channel, among say, say for one particular channel, might sort of somehow deviate from what the, the second channel or the third channel was doing. And in the end, you might observe, say, some uh, color shifts that would not be desirable. So yeah, so we have to do this uh, for all three of them. I see, okay, cool. Well, thank you very much for your time. And I'd like to everybody to thank our speakers again for joining us and giving us such a, another nice TGC session. Um, please follow us on uh, Twitter and uh, like our YouTube videos to be updated with our uh, most up-to-date information. And apart from that, we will see you guys next week. Have a good day, everybody, and a happy April Fools. Bye, and thanks. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. Bye, thank you.